All right, welcome back. Afternoon full of presentations here. We're here with Mr. Nick Ripplinger and Eric Flesher from Battlesite Technologies. And they the topic of their presentation is nightfall. So I'm sure they will explain that term in, in more detail. But I'll uh, hand it over to Nick and Eric here to get started. And remember, 10 minute presentation, ring the bell, 10 minute Q&A. Nick Ripplinger with Battlesite Technologies. First and foremost, I just want to thank everybody at the X-Tech team and everybody behind the scenes who've made this competition continue on as scheduled. I know that was no easy feat with everything that's going on in the world. Next slide, please. So in Iraq and Afghanistan, we were dependent on airdrop resupplies while we were downrange, and we also trained for these. Unfortunately, so many millions of dollars have been lost by these packages not being able to be recovered or finding out where they are the enemy grabbing them. So our falling saber device sees, seeks to change that. It's so bad that it's been depicted in movies and several news articles written. Next slide. So, sorry, just dealing with the delay here. So falling saber. One more slide. Oh, sorry, one more slide. Not you, Andy. So if you could cut to uh, just the video feed real fast. Falling Saber, this working prototype, measures in about three and a half inches by two and a half inches by one inch. And it's a GPS enabled communication device that interacts in real time with an ATAC or Net Warrior type device. device. And we'll hold it up in front of the screen real fast so you can get a quick look at the real time data. And then we'll go to a static image. So on the static image over here, what you just saw in real time was our current location in blue, our first airdrop package, which is right across the street and 0.11 miles away, that has zero roll and a 0.12 degree pitch. So it's very easy for us to recover this one. Package two is a very similar location right behind this 10 digit grid. Package three ended up in the river and is a lost airdrop. And package four ended up in enemy territory. We're going to write that one off and not find it. So when you focus on package one and two, you can realize that we have that real-time ability to make those command decisions on how we're going to recover these assets and how we're going to resupply the men and women on the ground. So if we could now go back to the uh, slides. Next slide, please. So the operational impact that we just showed in real time, we're giving the commanders on the ground real time decision making ability to go relocate, locate and recover these packages versus walking around. We're giving that pinpoint accuracy with the ability to turn on lights and sounds as well, should the package be obstructed. It enables recovery of asset and it saves a massive amount of time and money on these lost assets. Next slide, please. So at Battlesite, we don't spend one penny of IRAD money without having an end user develop, uh, end user identified. And this was jointly developed with the first special forces group out of Japan, as well as the 353rd special operations group out of Kadena during a joint training exercise. Basically, they were doing airdrop training and we're losing packages in the high grass, which was costing us thousands of dollars in flight time, as well as manpower hours. But over the course of this development, we've identified several other use cases for this, such as the tagging, tracking, and locating of vehicles, supplies, and personnel, downed air crew, and also pre-jump uh, atmospherics. So currently, we fly over to the drop zone and throw streamers out the back of a C-130. Then we fly over a second time, figure out where those streamers went, and adjust our positioning over the drop zone with the aircraft for the third time where we actually release the jumpers and air supply or resupplies. So now we're eliminating two of those flyovers by putting this on a disposable drone, flying over, capturing all that atmospheric data. So we only have to do one pass over a drop zone, which doesn't sound that big when you think of the current conflicts in Iraq and Afghanistan. But when you start thinking peer near peer that have air defense, this is a massive issue that's gotta be addressed. Next slide, please. So like we just mentioned, this product was born out of customer need. We know the customer because everybody here at Battlesite has been a customer at one point in their life. And with the peer and near peer threat ever evolving, this is needed now. 
that we always deploy our airborne troops first because they have more capabilities and we need to make sure that we get these men and women on the ground safer and also get them resupplied in a safer manner. And we're going to do all of this by leveraging our existing soft and DOD customer base as well as our distribution. Next slide, please. So our competitive advantage is that we do have patent pending on our following Sabre device. There's nothing like it on the market. Currently, we have the JPAD system, which is a GPS guided delivery system for airdropped assets. That really only works for our high value assets. It doesn't work when we're dropping a few cases of MREs and some ammo to the men and women on the ground. And Battlesite does have this proven track record within the SOF and DOD, as well as the intelligence communities. We have over 11% uh, project or 11 times projected growth this year with some of these other product lines coming online. And I think what really makes Battlesite is unique is our disruptive time to market strategy. And we'll get to that here in a second. Next slide, please. So our path forward right now, Battlesite, <clears throat> excuse me, Battlesite has about $100,000 invested into this working prototype and we're calling it a TRL level four. Like you just saw in the demonstration, we have proof of concept, we have working prototypes. Over the course of the next six months, we plan on investing about a quarter million dollars to finalize our code and shrink our form factor down by 75%. So just so it's less weight on the soldier or on the packages. And over the course of the next year, we believe we'll get to a fully commercialized product with about another million dollars worth of investment. Next slide, please. So mitigated risk is the number one thing that we try to focus on on Battlesite when bringing a new product in. We're not trying to reinvent the wheel here. We're not trying to sell the Army a whole full-blown system. We're trying to have a built-on add-on to the existing system. So we're using proven technology components commercially available chipsets. We're using our proprietary software and firmware with one of our partners embedded encryption. So we're encrypting at the file level. So whether our device gets stolen, captured, or ends up in the river and recovered by people we don't want, there's no data at compromise during any of this. We're using additive manufacturing to rapidly advance the form factor size, which allows us to meet that 12 month timeline. Next slide, please. So our team capabilities, we're not in this alone. Battlesite is one component to this. And we bring the operational knowledge, extensive hardware knowledge, and that real end user experience in utilizing our existing contract vehicles to advance this internal development project to date. We're utilizing Data Anchor to provide our encryption software. Like I mentioned, we're encrypting every piece of data at the file level, so nothing resides on the device. And so that way everything's protected should something happen. And we're utilizing Mile 2 a great software partner of ours who's got experience through the ATO process and getting, you know, third party software on DOD networks. Next slide, please. So our demonstrated success, Battlesite started off and still is a communications company. We started off with our flagship product, the Kraytac, which is an infrared marking device for low light, no light communication. We've moved on to our SWEAR, uh, sorry, near and SWEAR cold fire technology for friend or foe identification on the battlefield. So Falling Saber is a natural step forward for giving the commanders on the ground real-time situational data. And as you can see in the picture, we do have existing contracts that allows us to go fly in C-130s and drop packages out to continue the testing at a very low cost. And with that, I'd love to open it up to questions and uh, see what we can answer for you. Thank you guys. We try. It's kind of the battle flight way, short and concise. <laughs> awesome. So, so we got plenty of plenty of uh, questions in here. Wonder if we can focus uh, maybe a little more information on some of the like RF communications protocols for it. How does it communicate with the end user device? Are there any anti jamming features integrated already, specifically maybe for a GPS denied environment? Yes, we're working on the GPS denied environment right now. Um, we're utilizing LoRa technology, which gives us eight miles worth of uh, field of view communications. Uh, eight miles currently. Okay. Now, if looking, if you're going into denied areas, what kind of communication is it using? I mean, do you have, is it a transponder? Is it, do you interrogate it and then it answers? Is it transmitting continuously? 
it's a what, mixture what of both. Go ahead. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. It's a mixture of both. So it's coded now to send up the GPS signal uh, five times so we can capture that data and then go silent. Uh, it's also integrated into the ATAC and NetWarrior uh, existing communication base. So if we had a mesh network of sorts, we'd still be able to communicate with it. And then we also have the ability to wake it up and collect data when we're within range. I think it, may, it might have been an acronym I just missed, but when you said it would, it had some functionality in a GPS tonight environment, what was that exactly? Yeah, so we're currently working on that solution right now. Um, okay. Okay. I think there's a lot of innovation going on in that space that we'd be looking for a commercial partner who's got that solution. Got it. Um, quick question on the supply chain, the question that's coming up, all the components, you said you, you don't like to create you know, all this new complexity. So is the supply chain all US-based or has that been validated? It is. We're working with the US-based distributor uh, on the supply chain. With everything going on in the world, that's been a massive focus, I think, for so many technology companies to include Battlesite. But with the Barry Act and everything else, we try to source everything within the United States for the compliance aspect as well as just good business practices. Got it. Um, one one question I had too: Is there any data that the that the army publishes, or any sort of anecdotal stuff that you can turn into the types of supply drops that are lost, and maybe a value that goes with that each month or year or specific um, environment? Yeah, uh, we've done a ton of research. We talked to a lot of end users. There's nothing publicly available on that. I don't think we like to advertise how much you know assets we've lost, but it's a significant enough problem that. You know, there's a couple different agencies looking into this technology. Another question, I think, how would you answer the question, I guess, because I'm thinking through if I think, okay, the supply drop is lost, the reason why you wouldn't go after that, you could, maybe you could argue you know where they are and it's just too dangerous to go out and you just kind of write it off. Have you done any research into, like, what are some of the other reasons why the supply drops are kind of, you know, intentionally left or unintentionally left out there? Yeah, I think the biggest reason is right now we drop into a known area, but we don't have that pinpoint data. And basically we have, you know, warfighters out there looking for these packages and something that could stretch miles compared to now where we know exactly where they are, whether we're going to take vehicles or whether we're going to take the you know, foot approach and to go recover those assets. It's a, a big no lack of knowledge, I think, that's causing a lot of these problems. Um, our enemies out there, Local nationals are out there, you know, trying to survive. They know if they can find one of these pallets, they can sell it back to us. Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah. it does, yeah. Yeah, uh, a couple Thank of people you. have asked in the questions. So for the demo for AUSA in the fall, what's your plan for demoing? How do you plan on demoing this? Yeah, so there's a couple different ways that we're doing and we're evaluating those now. Um, for the, we can put it on a drone and fly it around and capture that data. We can also look into disposable drones and fly and drop that out, um, as well as we have the base unit and the AT our simulated ATAC units that we can move around on the floor and show that we're capturing that real-time data. We can also kill the encryption. So if we're doing a demonstration and let's say you hand it off to somebody we didn't want to have it handed off to, we could hit a button instantly and it'll go and show the ciphertext versus the actual uh, user experience. I have one question because I think I heard you a previous one, but it might help the audience here. But could you walk through like an example use case of someone who's actively tracking it through when it gets dropped out, how that person is then going to go, you know, translate, transmit that information to partners or collaborators within the Army to go grab that? Yeah, so with this being tied into the ATAC or NetWarrior system, we really have enterprise access to that data. And it's really picking and choosing. If you know the 82nd guys are on the east side and we're dropping on the east side, we can focus that data only to the organization on there, or we can broadcast it wide range that, you know, the 101st is on the other side of the, the map. Everybody can see it in real time. Okay. Another question here, or two, two questions, I guess. First one, um, one, are, are lost drops usually within an eight mile radius? What's, what's the average sort of like, hey, I'm, 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 I don't know where this is, uh, radius that you're looking in? Yeah, that's a great question. It's usually within five miles, which is why we selected a solution that added more capabilities than that. 
And we can really, it's as simple as changing out the chipset for the communication side. All the encryption and all the back end stuff stays the same. So we can really swap out that communication chip with whatever the Army needs. It's a simple two solder solution. Got it. Um, next one, what specific communication profile, uh, sorry, communication protocol within the eight mile radius are you using? We're using LoRa RF. Okay. So it's so the, uh, the commercially, commercially available communication does that require protocol. require like a, a satellite or anything or, or is that just direct? That is direct, but we do have the satellite capability. Again, it's just swapping out that chipset for right now, for where we are in the development, it was cheaper to use a commercial off the shelf, but there's, you know, hundreds of different protocols out there, cellular, Wi-Fi, satellite, so it's simple, it's just swapping out a chipset. I think maybe to, to dig a little deeper on that too, so what's, what's battle sites right to win? Because I think everyone really enjoys and, and it resonates that you're using off the shelf components to solve a problem, right? You're not trying to reinvent the wheel and stuff, but what's your right to win in this space? Yeah, I think our right to win is our you know short but proven track record of being a communications company for the men and women on the ground. Like we said, we started off with the Craytech. We have these existing relationships with our existing customers who felt comfortable enough to bring us their problem that we were able to rapidly, within 48 hours, turn around a working prototype. And I think it's you know our speed and our willingness and that there's really no pride of authorship here that we want to work and engage with these end customers and truly identify what the root cause of the problem is and come up with the simplest solution. Our first product was a crayon, very simple product with some complex chemistry behind it. But the speed that we were able to move there kind of gained us the reputation and the respect of our end users so that they would bring us their problems. One of the questions we had here was talking about your, you know, you have a US based distributor, but are the components of your device, are they made in the United States? I think, I think to be realistic, some of them are and some of them are not. But that's something that we'll definitely analyze once we finalize the final chipsets and processors and everything that goes into this and go move into our proprietary printed circuit boards. Got it. And I guess the, the final one of the final questions here would be now, for your concerning business use cases, such as tracking shipping containers, are you looking at things like that? And how does that different, or what's the difference between that and other commercial solutions, What your solution? Absolutely, I think there's a ton of commercial applications here. We're talking to some of the airlines for baggage as well, um, but I think the most exciting potential on the commercial side is the drone delivery. And right now they're using RFID, so you have to have that receiver at every door and on every vehicle to track while it's going. We're now we're utilizing existing open networks of communication while encrypting it. It really opens up the uh, variety of ways and packages that we can track, not just for a military airdrop. Awesome, cool. Well, well, Nick, thank you so much for the presentation and sharing the Q&A with us. Yep. Thank you, everybody. I just wanna, again, stress how impressed we are with how you guys pulled all this together. It's, we really appreciate it. Awesome. Yeah, the XTech search team is pretty special to get this stuff going, so I'm sure they appreciate that.